Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our study of the Gospel of Mark. I hope that you had a restful night's sleep last night, and uh, I'm just grateful that God has wakened us to another day of life, another day of blessing, another day to assemble as his people, another day to study his word together. And I look forward to our assembly at 10 o'clock today, whether that will be in person with you or whether you will be joining us through the, the live stream on YouTube. We would normally be wrapping up uh, our quarter of study today. We started this study of the Gospel of Mark at the beginning of January. Normally, we would take three months to do that. Uh, but because we're going to begin our in-person Bible classes again on May the 2nd, Scott and I decided that we would both extend our current classes, mine on Sunday morning and his on Wednesday evening. We would continue those through the, the month of April so that we could start uh, afresh with some new studies on May the 2nd. And uh, Scott will be shifting to Sunday morning and I'll be shifting to Wednesday evening and sharing a midweek study with you on YouTube as well as in person. So I'm grateful that that bought us a few more weeks that, that we could slow down just a little bit. And I couldn't have come at a better time really as we're moving closer to Mark's account of the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, the burial, and ultimately the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so uh, next week, uh, as we start chapter 14, we won't feel pushed uh, to get through that, but we'll have four Sundays remaining after today to discuss Mark chapter 14 and 15 and, and the rather brief Mark chapter 16. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, longer ending of Mark that appears in some translations, and we'll talk about some of the textual uh, issues that, that are involved in that. Uh, but today, we're going to be finishing uh, Mark chapter 12 and then getting in through into Mark chapter 13, at which point I'm going to jump off from there uh, to Matthew chapter 24 and use Matthew's account, and I'll, I'll explain that when we get there. But I want to remind you, as, as we get ready to begin reading at verse 35 um, of, of Mark chapter 12, that there have been a series of questions that have come to Jesus uh, the first of those questions comes from the religious leaders after Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem with such great uh, jubilation among the people. Shouts of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Even the children were crying out. Uh, Jesus uh, cleansed the temple of the merchandisers and the money changers. He was healing in the temple, and he just takes the status quo in the temple and turns it on its head. And this causes the, the religious leaders to ask him the question in verse 28 of Mark chapter 11, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you the authority to do this? And you remember Jesus's uh, reply that they're wanting to, to back him into a corner. Uh, if he claimed divine authority, they would charge him with blasphemy. If he said it wasn't divine authority, then no man had the authority to do what he was doing. So he asked them regarding John's baptism, okay, you tell me, you answer my question and I'll answer yours. Was John's baptism from heaven, was it from God or was it from men? the same uh, quandary that they were attempting to put him in. And they reasoned together and, and decided, you know, if, if we say that John's baptism was for men, it was just uh, humanly manufactured by John himself. We fear the people because the people recognize John to have been a prophet. Uh, if we say his baptism and his preaching was from heaven, Jesus is going to say, well, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you follow him? Why didn't you repent? Why weren't you baptized by him in the Jordan River? So they refused to answer Jesus's question, and he refused to answer theirs. And then you remember uh, either last week or the week before from Mark chapter 12, verse 13, some of the Pharisees and Herodians came to Jesus uh, trying to catch him in his words. And this is the question about paying the, the tribute tax 
to Caesar, whether that was lawful for Jews to do or not. And I didn't mention it when we discussed this before, but Luke really gives us a little more insight into exactly what they were trying to do. That he identifies the total insincerity of, of the questions that were beginning to come to Jesus. In Luke chapter 20, verses um, 20 and, and uh, well, actually just verse 20 of Luke chapter 20, keeping a close watch on Jesus, they, that is the religious leaders, sent spies and pretended to be sincere. Uh, they hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. And this is what Luke records right before his account of the question about uh, the tribute tax to Caesar. And so really what they're wanting to try to get Jesus to say is that, that no, you shouldn't pay that tax, which would get him in trouble with the Roman government. But Luke just makes it so plain uh, that there was nothing sincere whatsoever in the words that Mark records Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? And you remember Jesus's response. Somebody give me a denarius. Whose picture is this? That's Caesar's. Looks like this belongs to him. So you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but far more importantly, you give to God those things that belong to God. And the people were amazed at his answer. No one saw that answer coming. On the heels of that, a third question, this time from the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection, didn't believe in spirits, didn't believe in angels, and yet based on the law of Moses, the Leveret law of marriage, uh, they, they share this scenario that I mentioned last week. They must have shared with Pharisees from time to time who did believe in the resurrection, trying to trip them up. Uh, the woman who was married successively to seven brothers. So you tell us, Jesus, in the resurrection, if you believe in a resurrection, uh, whose wife will she be? And Jesus says, you know, you ask me this question, but you only ask me this question because you don't understand the scriptures and you don't understand the power of God. The power of God will raise people, but not like we were born into this world. He will raise us to an incredible new life, different life, eternal life, glorious life. There won't be marrying or being given in marriage, but we will be like the angels of God. Uh, beings that the Sadducees denied even existed. And he says, you don't know your own scriptures. You focus on the Torah, you focus on the books of the law, and you don't even remember from Exodus chapter 3 uh, when God, Yahweh, says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob. Uh, men who had been dead, their bodies had been dead for centuries, their spirits lived at that moment, that very moment, uh, with God. And so Jesus says, if you had read the scriptures carefully, you would see that God was saying, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And right on the heels of that, in Mark chapter 12, verse, verse 28, is when the teacher of the law comes to Jesus, wanting to know of all the commandments, of all those 613 laws and statutes and ordinances, the 365 negative ones, the 248 positive ones, of all the heavy ones and the light ones, the great ones and the small ones, which is the greatest, which is the most important? And Jesus answered from Deuteronomy 6, and Leviticus chapter 19, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then uh, verse uh, 34 of Mark 12 says, when Jesus saw that, that the man had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him, any more questions. So you got the question on the temple grounds, who gave you this authority? You've got the, the question, is it lawful to pay the uh, imperial tax to Caesar? Uh, what about the resurrection? Whose wife is this woman going to be? And then this question about uh, the greatest commandment of all. And as people perceived that the way that Jesus handled these questions, that you couldn't paint him into a corner. You couldn't put him on the horns of a dilemma. They stopped asking him questions. 
that is until his trial, and, and we'll get there over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the next time Jesus is going to be questioned, it's going to be by the high priest, it's going to be by the Sanhedrin, it's going to be by Pilate, it's going to be by Herod, Herod uh, Antipas. So now at verse 35 of, of Mark chapter 12, it's, it's almost like, okay, you guys are done asking me questions. Um, I kind of like this question game we've been playing, so let me ask you a question. And um, G Jesus knows their hearts. Jesus knows that they're not sincerely seeking uh, to answer his questions, but, but he gives them a real poser. It sort of reminds me of what Paul does in, in writing to the Corinthian church. Uh, these people who were so proud of their spiritual gifts, love to flaunt them, love to use their spiritual gifts to elevate themselves above their brothers and sisters who had differing gifts. Um, Jesus, uh, excuse me, Paul says, you know, um, I don't like th this boasting game you're playing this bragging game that, that you're playing, but okay, I'll play along. And, and here's what I could boast about. And he gives that litany of, of sufferings and afflictions that he had. And, and yet he said, I count all of that as, as nothing for the sake of, of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, in a similar way, as, as Paul says, you know, okay, I'll dull, indulge in a little foolishness. Uh, Jesus does that here. And he gives them a question that they cannot answer. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, this is verse 35 of Mark chapter 12, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? Well, sure enough, Old Testament scripture said that the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who would sit uh, upon the, the throne and reign forever would be a descendant of David. But he says, why did the teachers of the law say that, that the Messiah is the son of David? Because David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, and then he quotes uh, Psalm 110, verse 1. Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. In fact, I think Psalm 110.1 is the most quoted verse from the Psalms in the New Testament. Uh, further down in this psalm is the statement, uh, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, and the writer of Hebrews will use that part of Psalm 110 in his arguments about the superiority of the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. But here, quoting from Psalm 110.1, the Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies uh, under your feet, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Uh, the, the scholars, the, the rabbis were pretty unanimous in, in thinking that Psalm 110 was a messianic psalm, uh, authored by David, and David is writing about the Messiah who was to come. And so Jesus asked them, well, if the Messiah is David's descendant, if, if he comes way down the line from David with this general understanding that ancestors are greater than their, their descendants, how can he refer to this descendant of his as being his Lord? as being greater than him. And it just blew their mind. Uh, they couldn't answer. And uh, that's, that's made clear in uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 46, that, that they could not answer him. It, it's much like John the Baptist saying of Jesus, um, he's greater than I because he existed before me. Um, anyone who was close to the family of Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and, and Jesus would have known that, according to the flesh, John was six months older th than Jesus. And yet he says, he's greater than I because he existed before me. He's acknowledging his divinity, his pre-existence. And David is acknowledging the same in Psalm 110, the Lord, Yahweh, and if you look back in, in uh, the, the text of Psalm 110, you'll see that the first appearance of Lord is, uh, the, there, there's an uppercase L, and then slightly smaller, but still uppercase O-R-D. Uh, that's the divine name, Jehovah, Yahweh. Jehovah or Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. 
David, in speaking of the Messiah, who would be, according to the flesh, his descendant, recognized that he was still far greater uh, th than he was because of who he was. He was the Son of God and because of his preexistence. And I love how Mark says here um, in verse 37, after Jesus says, David himself uh, calls him Lord. How then can he be his son if he calls him Lord? The large crowd listened to him with delight. And I think part of their delight was probably the fact that uh, the question couldn't be answered by those that, that Jesus questioned. Um, then he gets within his, his sights, the religious leaders again, and he tells the people, verse 38, watch out for the teachers of the law. Now, in a somewhat parallel passage, uh, much more extended in Matthew 23, uh, Jesus says, now, now whatever the teachers of the law uh, teach you, do that and observe it because they, they were good teachers of the law. But he said, don't do according to their deeds. Don't follow their examples. Uh, that They say things, they don't do them. They, they love show. They, they love pretense. They love the applause of men. They love accolades. Watch out for the teachers of the law, Jesus said. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted, greeted with respect in the marketplaces. Uh, in Matthew 23, they wore these broad phylacteries on, on their foreheads. They had these long tassels on their garments. Uh, they loved to be called rabbi. They loved to be called master. They loved to be called father. They loved to be called teacher. Um, they liked to be greeted that way in the marketplaces uh, and, and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. But he says, they devour widows' houses and for a show, they make lengthy prayers. Uh, Jesus talked about their lengthy prayers in Matthew chapter 6 uh, when he warns us not to practice our righteousness uh, before others in order to be noticed by them, in order to receive man's applause rather than God's applause. And he warns them, you know, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray uh, in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by others. He goes on to say, and don't be like the Gentiles either, for they suppose that they will be heard for their long prayers. Uh, you think about the, the parable of Jesus in Luke 18 with the, uh, the, the Pharisee praying uh, undoubtedly loudly in the temple, thanking God that he was not like other people, bragging to God about the tithes that he gave, even of his household spices, bragging about his uh, twice weekly fast that, that he did. And, and he mentions devouring widows' houses. Scholars tell us that, that these teachers of the law, the, the religious leaders, uh, weren't really paid for the work that they did. They, they subsisted off of charity from others. Uh, people who supported them in, in the work that they did, and they seemed to have preyed upon the most vulnerable and the, the most unsuspecting. They preyed upon widows, those who had the least uh, amount of resources to, to live on, to fall back on, and, and they would uh, just take the money of, of these widows. And so I think that's why immediately we have the story of Jesus observing the widow in, in the temple. So these are men who would take advantage rather than defending the, 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 the widows and, and the fatherless and providing for them. They're taking away what little they have. And Jesus says, these men will be punished most severely. And then verse 41 says that, that Jesus sits down uh, opposite the place where the offerings were put in, in the courtyard of the temple there, and they watch the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Well, we know that the temple treasury had to at least be in the court of women. Uh, because this widow is there. You remember there was the sanctuary proper, there was the holy place and, and the most holy place. There was uh, the, the immediate courtyard where the altar of burnt offering was and, and the labor that was used uh, for washings. Outside of that, and, and only priests and Levites could serve there, outside of that was the court of Israel, which was the court of the men of Israel, Beyond that, the court of women, 
where Jewish women uh, could come and pray. And um, that's as close as they could get uh, to the place where, where God's presence dwelled. And outside of that, the, the court of the Gentiles. So this, this treasury box had to have been in, in the court of women. And so many times Jesus is being scrutinized. He's under the microscope. And I love how Jesus turns the tables here. He sits down and he does some people watching. He's observing people as they put their gifts, uh, their gifts to the Lord, their offerings to God in, in the temple treasury. And uh, Mark writes that many rich people threw in large amounts. And from a human standpoint, if you're just looking at uh, the, the, the dollar sign or what follows the dollar sign, the, the amount of the gift, from a human standpoint, it was impressive and people must have thought uh, how generous, um, how sacrificial to give such a large amount of money. But they had a, a huge, uh, they, they had incredible possessions. They had massive wealth. And even though it looked like they were giving a great amount of money, in reality, it was a penance. It was a tiny percentage of what they had, probably far, far less than a tithe. And, um, you know, the New Testament teaches us proportional giving, that, that we give in, in, uh, in accordance with the way that, that we have been prospered. But then Jesus sees this poor widow and she comes in and puts in the two smallest coins in existence, uh, two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And in human eyes, you see this, these great sums of money, and you see these two little copper coins that, that only amount to a few cents. And by human standards, who gives the greater gift? Well, the rich people gave the greatest gifts not by the standards of the kingdom of God, not by the, the standards of God's um, viewing of, of the heart and, and what prompts our, our giving. Uh, Jesus says that, that the least important person around the treasury box that day was the one who was most honored by God, and she certainly becomes the one who is most praised by Jesus. Why? Because of the, the largeness of the amount that she gave? No, because it, it represented all that she had. That was it. She didn't have anything else to live on, and yet she makes a full sacrifice, a complete commitment. Uh, Lord, this isn't much. I don't know what you can even do with this, but what is mine is yours. And she puts that in, in the treasury box. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They uh, all gave out of their wealth, out of their extreme wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. And she trusted that she would be provided for. And I would love to believe uh, that, that God did just that. And that this woman, um, some eight weeks later, when uh, around the same temple, Peter and, and the other apostles begin proclaiming the, the message of the risen Christ, proclaiming that message in the languages of the entire Mediterranean world, languages that they had never studied. Uh, I would love to believe that she becomes uh, a part of that, either that initial 3,000 that are baptized on Pentecost, or uh, a part of, of the larger group of disciples as we continue to read uh, about the growth of the church in, in the book of Acts. By Acts chapter 4, verse 4, there's 5,000 men, uh, not including women, who had uh, become Christians. I, I would love to believe that this precious widow um, was among that number, and she was among those who were being provided for on a daily basis by the early church. So Mark chapter 13, uh, verse 1, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked, uh, excuse me, I started at verse 3. You already figured that out. Chapter 13, verse 1, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what massive stones 
Uh, what magnificent buildings. Jesus had been in, in the temple grounds uh, and around the temple grounds every year of his life when pilgrimages were made. During his three-year ministry, he was in uh, Jerusalem on, on numerous occasions, taught in the temple on many occasions. I don't know what prompted th this statement about the impressiveness of the temple complex at this point, uh, but it was indeed impressive. Uh, this was the second temple, Zerubbabel's temple, that had been dedicated, uh, had been built after the return from captivity, was dedicated about 515 BC. And so having been dedicated in 515 BC, by this time in the life of Jesus, the second temple was almost 550 years old. And yet about 20 BC, Herod the Great had started a refurbishment uh, program, a beautification program, um, uh, an enhancement program of the temple grounds. You remember in John chapter 2, when the people asked Jesus what sign he's going to perform to indicate, uh, to, to back up the authority uh, that he seemed to demonstrate, Jesus said, uh, the only sign I'm going to give you is this, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. And, and they say, raise it up again in three days? This temple has been under construction for 46 years. Uh, when Jesus began his ministry at about the age of 30, uh, that ongoing um, renovation project had been going on for 46 years. Now, at this point, that's it's three years later, 49 years, so almost 50 years that this um, expansion program and uh, refurbishment program of the temple grounds had been going on, and it was indeed impressive. Um, if you've had the opportunity to go to the Western Wall in Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall, or if you've seen uh, documentaries about it or read articles about it, uh, the, the foundation stones of the Temple Mount, you see the, the ground level at, at the base of the Wailing Wall, the foundation stones keep going down below ground level. Uh, off to, to the left, as you're facing that wall, there's an indoor part you can go in, and they've excavated down, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 feet. They've covered it with plexiglass, and it's lit underneath, and you can see these massive foundation stones that go way down below ground level with the Herodian beveled edges uh, that, that signified them as, as being part of, of Herod's um, work on, on the temple that he began and that continued long after he died. So they comment on, on the magnificence of the buildings and the stones, and Jesus says, do you see all these buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. This temple's been here for almost 550 years, and, and you're saying that it's going to be rubble? that not one stone is going to be stacked upon another. So as they make their way out of the city of Jerusalem and make it across the Kidron Valley to, to the Mount of Olives, he's sitting there looking back across the, the Kidron Valley to the Temple Mount. And with him are Peter, James, and John. That's not surprising. We find them with Jesus on, on at least three occasions, uh, just themselves. But Andrew, Peter's brother is also there, and they asked Jesus privately, tell us then, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? And in their minds, they think that the destruction of the temple must signal the end of the world, because they cannot imagine a world where there is no temple. So at this point, I want us, rather than continuing in the text here in Mark chapter 13, I'm going to have us follow the parallel account in Matthew 24, simply because the delineation between two great events is much clearer in Matthew's gospel than it is in Mark's account. Uh, so bear with me in doing that. I want you to turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 24, and then at the end of reading that together and making a few comments, We'll jump back to the end of Mark chapter 13. So going to Matthew's account of what we just read in Mark 13, Matthew 24, 1, Jesus left the temple, was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will, uh, everyone will be thrown down. 
As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? This has got to be the end of the world. Um, if, if you are coming, if God is coming in judgment on this place and it's destroyed, that's got to be the end of the world. So they're looking for a single answer, uh, an answer regarding a single event. And what Jesus gives them instead is a description of two events. The first of which is a prediction of something that's going to happen 40 years later with the destruction of, of the temple by the Roman army in AD 70. And then he's going to transition to talking about the end of the age, the end of the world, the consummation of all things. So because time is, is getting, it looks like we've been going about 30 minutes here. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this too much, but I want you to read with me through Matthew's account here in Matthew 24. First, he addresses the things that are going to lead up to the destruction of the temple. Verse 4, Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah and will deceive many. Bottom line here, prepare yourself for false messiahs. Uh, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Uh, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, kind of business as usual, sadly, in this world. Again, sadly, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, things that had always happened, things that continue to happen. All these things are the beginning of birth pangs. Then you'll be handed, then he talks to them between now and the destruction of the temple. These are some of the things you're going to suffer. You'll be handed over to be persecuted. Some of you will be put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Even by AD 70, the gospel has gone, gone out through much of, of the known world. Uh, but then he says in verse 16, So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. He references something here that first appears in Daniel chapter 9. Um, Daniel in uh, Babylonian captivity and then un under Persian rule uh, foresees events that were going to transpire between then and the coming of the Christ in the intertestamental period. And he foretold what was going to happen in 168 BC or 167 BC with uh, the desecration of the temple, this abomination that makes desolate. And that took place uh, because of the despotic rule of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He was one of Alexander the Great's generals that, uh, excuse me, his, one, of his, and one of his Antiochus IV's uh, great-great-great-grandfather uh, was one of Alexander the Great's generals, and um, they were given control of, of Syria, and um, actually it was Seleucus what was the general, and this is his descendant, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, and in anger against the Jews, he desecrates the temple. He sacrifices a sow. He pours the broth all over uh, the, the floor of the temple. And temple worship is stopped for three years. And it's not reinstated until three years later when the Maccabean revolt begins. Uh, the festival of Hanukkah, the festival of lights, celebrates that event and commemorates that rededication of the temple in 164 or 165 BC. But Jesus says history is going to repeat itself. Uh, this temple, Zerubbabel's temple, was desecrated once. It's going to be destroyed 
um, not, not many years from now. So the parallel account in Luke 20, 20, 20, uh, verses 20 and 21 of Luke chapter 20 says, when you see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, then know that her desolation is at hand. Jesus is telling his followers, telling the early church, there are signs that you will be able to look for that will let you know when it's time to go, when it's time to get out of the city. And remember, this section makes absolutely no sense if Jesus is talking about the end of the world, if it's talking about Jesus' second coming, if it's talking about the resurrection and judgment. Uh, getting out of the city is not going to make any difference. Not going from your rooftop down into the, your house um, and getting your possessions it isn't going to make any difference. Whether it's in the winter or on a Sabbath day isn't going to make any difference uh, at the end of time. But in regard to the impending destruction of Jerusalem, there will be signals that will allow you to escape. So he says, when you see um, th this coming abomination that makes desolate, when the armies begin to surround the city, the Roman armies, um, verse 17, let no one on the rooftop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter when travel would be difficult, when it would be cold, or on the Sabbath day when the city gates would be shut. Uh, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equaled again. So Jesus said, there will be signs, there will be signs, there will be signs. Look for the signs and get out of the city before the siege begins. If those days, and notice this description here of a period of time, those days, if those days hadn't been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, he's, uh, look here's the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time, log this in, remember it. Um, so if anyone tells you, uh, there he is out in the wilderness, don't go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Don't be lured into staying in the city. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even to the west, so it will, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. There is going to be extensive uh, death and destruction. Tens of thousands of people will lose their lives in the destruction of Jerusalem. Immediately after the distress of those days, and then he mentioned some things that may sound like uh, the end of the world, but it's typical prophetic language found many places in the Old Testament about cos th these descriptions of cosmic upheaval are indications of something significant uh, changing, a, a new order coming uh, in into being, coming into place. Uh, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. The heavenly bodies will be shaken. And he's not speaking literally here. He's using figurative apocalyptic language, much as Joel does in Joel chapter 2 uh, to prophesy about Pentecost. And uh, I think we've got time to turn over there for just a second to turn to Acts chapter 2. And... Um, Peter says in verse 15 of Acts chapter 2, in response to the accusation that these voices that we're hearing and in these languages we don't understand, uh, that other people understand, that, but, but that we don't, these men must be drunk. Peter says, these people aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel prophesied about this day. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Well, sure enough, here comes the, the Spirit descending upon the, the apostles on Pentecost. But then notice what follows, still quoting from Joel chapter 2, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, 
blood and fire and billows, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That was being fulfilled that day too. Um, a new order, a new age, a new manifestation of God's kingdom was being ushered in, and it's described in these terms of cosmic up upheaval. Jesus says that's what's going to be happening in AD 70. Uh, temple worship will cease forever. It, it will never be uh, resumed. It will never be restored. The sacrificial system uh, that continued to be practiced even after the ministry of Jesus for another 40, 40 years that will be done. The, the, the Levitical priesthood will be done. All of their family records will be destroyed. And that is truly significant. And so Jesus describes it in this language. Uh, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and all the peoples. And I, brothers and sisters, I, because of the time text that comes a few verses later, I still think this is all a description of what is happening uh, or what will happen in AD 70. Uh, they will mourn when they see the, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, not a literal coming, but a symbolic coming, a coming in judgment with great power and great glory. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. They will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. I think this is a description of the protection that God will provide for the church in having warned them to flee the city and not be caught up in its destruction. Uh, Jesus says, Again, look for signs, look for signs, look for signs. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, all these things in those days, then you will know that it is near, right at the door. Don't miss it. Truly, I tell you, and this is the time text. Uh, many people have called it verse 34, the time text in the discussion thus far. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not uh, pass away until all these things have happened. That's why, even though I think some of these verses are hard to explain within the context of, of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70, I, I think we're compelled to because Jesus says, everything I've just described uh, will happen before this generation passes away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And then a transition text, a transition text uh, to a discussion of his personal second coming, the end of time, the resurrection, the judgment. Um, and notice the difference in the language. Up until now, those days, those days, those days, these things, these things, these things, signs, 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 signs. Now, verse 36, but about that day or hour, no one knows. Not a period of time, but a day, a, a, a single day. Of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And then notice how he says, in regard to that day, there will be no signs. There will be nothing to look for. It will come out of nowhere, it will come like a thief in the night. As in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. No signs before that coming. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Not in regard to his coming in judgment against Jerusalem and the temple, look for all these signs, but not in regard to my personal second coming. Um, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding uh, with a, a hand mill, one will be taken, the other left. I think this is the separation of, of the sheep from the goats. Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. There will be no indications. There will be no signs. Uh, there will be no warnings. Uh, but understand this, 
If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So also you must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So in regard to the destruction of Jerusalem, all these things must happen first. Uh, sadly, life as usual in regard to kingdom, battling kingdom and, and wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines. But when you see those armies starting to gather around the city of Jerusalem, before that siege starts, you get out. Uh, don't go back. Uh, pray th that it's uh, not in the winter. Pray that it's not on a Sabbath day. Pray that you're uh, not pregnant. Uh, pray that you don't have small children. The, the journey, uh, the escape will be so much more difficult for you. But when Jesus comes again, none of those things are, are, are going to, to need to be taken into consideration. So instead of reading from verse 45 down through the end of Matthew 24, let's jump back to the end of, of Mark chapter 13 and read how Mark concludes this section. <clears throat> verse 32 Mark chapter 13, but about that day and hour, no one knows, uh, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. You keep watch because you don't know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And that's what Jesus says to us. Watch, wait, be ready. Um, his coming might before, let's see what time is it here. It's, it's, nearly eight o'clock on, on Saturday night, Jesus could come back before anyone even watches this. It may never premiere at 6.30 on Sunday morning because Jesus may come. Um, we need to be ready tonight for him to come. We need to be ready tomorrow. We need to be ready the next, next day. Uh, our spiritual bags need to be packed. We need to be ready to go. Uh, when, whenever he comes. And I, and I truly pray uh, that in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit, uh, that you are. And if you aren't, uh, then get ready. Uh, confess Jesus as God's son. Turn from sin. Be united with him uh, in baptism. Let him wash away your sins, every stain of guilt. Let the Holy Spirit take up residence in you. Let God add you to his church. Live daily um, in, in walking with God and following in the footsteps of Jesus and just live in that constant readiness, um, regardless of when it may come. I appreciate the, the time that, that we've had. I've gone far longer than I intended to, uh, this morning, but I appreciate you hanging in there to the end of the study and look forward to seeing you at 10 o'clock, whether in person in the auditorium or through the live stream. God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.